Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is the two o'clock block here on a given Thursday. We have uh, Pono Chung and Jason Chung. I get Pono Chung and Jason Chung, not related. Huh? <laughs> and uh, we're talking about the Hawaii Defense Alliance here on the military in Hawaii. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Hey, aloha, Jay. Aloha, thank you for having us. Great to have you here. So, um, you know, we've been covering the military in Hawaii for a while. We've been uh, covering various aspects of the MAC, called it the Military Affairs Committee, the Chamber of Commerce. We met a lot of people, um, but you're in a different category in a sense, uh, because you're talking about the connection between the Military Affairs Committee and the well, civilian community, the, uh, the business community. I really want to know about that. So, Jason, how did you get involved in the Hawaii Defense Alliance, and how did you get involved in this nexus we're talking about? Yeah, Jay, thank. That's a great question. And so, as you know, the Military Affairs Council primarily advocates on behalf of the military here in Hawaii, but we also kind of bridged uh, the gap with the local communities as well as the uh, businesses that do business with the military. Uh, and so, the Hawaii Defense Alliance came into play as it wasn't one of our primary uh, priorities that the MAC normally looked at, you know, which was training lands, Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard, and Red Hill. Uh, but on the periphery, we always did work with local companies to really build out that local industrial base, right? The more jobs and opportunity we can get for local companies, we knew that would benefit the military in terms of readiness, but as well as help local uh, economy and opportunities here for, for you know, the local folks. Uh, and so an opportunity came up um, after a, a DBED uh, SWOT analysis about looking at standing up a Hawaii Defense uh, Alliance. Uh, and so the MAC uh, put in a bid for it uh, to win the grant, and we did. And, you know, Pono, we, we brought on as our program manager for it with uh, his background experience in workforce development, and some other areas, to really uh, formalize uh, this process now where we look at how do we get more opportunities uh, for local business. Very important, you know, because uh, we have a long relation. We, the civilian community, we have a long relationship with the military in Hawaii. It's really part of our DNA. You know, people sometimes don't, don't realize that, but it's been going on for a long time, like 175 years altogether. It's, uh, it's, it's got real legs here in Hawaii. And so this is an important thing to do, um, particularly in view of um, you know, the, the future of this nexus and the future of our state, uh, our need to have all the business opportunities we can get and our need to have the military here uh, and happily ensconced with the business community. So what you're doing is very important. Uh, well, let me, let me uh, oh, and I wanted to ask you this. Now, you, you, uh, you had some time in the military, um, which also qual qualifies you to take this job as president but of the alliance, yeah? Uh, so can you talk about your time in the military, what you did, and how much you enjoyed it? Sure, Jay. I would love to do it. Um, you know, born and raised in Hawaii, but I uh, joined the Reserve and Guard uh, probably about 40 years, a little more than 40 years ago. Uh, but then I went on active duty after doing that for a few years uh, after graduating University of Hawaii. Uh, so I was a uh, Army intelligence officer and did that for 30 years. Uh, spent the majority of my time in uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, working with special forces. And then uh, the other half of my career, primarily here in uh, the Indo-Pacific region, with tours in Korea and then tours here also in Hawaii, and really enjoyed uh, doing what I did as an intelligence officer. Uh, when I retired, I actually took a job with a tech company, uh, but then got offered uh, this position with the Military Affairs Council. And I thought, what a great opportunity. You know, Two things that I really care about, obviously Hawaii uh, and, and obviously the military, which has been a part of my adult life. Uh, so that's how I kind of got pulled in to, to the Military Affairs Council and, and doing that work. So really fortunate to be in this position. Great. It's, it's, it's great to talk to you. Great to meet you. So, um, you know, Pono Chan, um, you bring um, a consultant's point of view to this. You had some experience in consulting with the Military Affairs uh, Council. Um, yes. Can you talk about uh, how you got involved in, in the alliance? So uh, thank you, Jace. Um, I was talking to both uh, Jason and Jennifer, and they were talking that this project was coming along, that they were going to apply um, for a uh, place a bid in for DBED, who, by the way, is the sponsor of this program. 
and the overall Hawaii defense uh, economy project. And uh, they were looking for kind of like a program manager to one service uh, the steering committee, as well as the working groups, provide the deliverables, do some of the research. And so I thought it was a great opportunity, I mean, like Jason, to be able to, one, uh, help military in Hawaii and help uh, residents and uh, small businesses be able to uh, work with the military. Yeah, so when you know, sort of when you say you're a consultant, you're really a business consultant, right? Uh, yes. And when you say you know you're in an alliance, um, I'm just guessing here, but the alliance would be an alliance of businesses and military commands uh, that are allied together for the the common good of both both sides of the equation. Yeah, and, absolutely. And also, so, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You also bring you know experience in the political arena. Uh, experience in the business community on Bishop Street, all those things. So you're, I, I don't know if I, it's the right way to put it, but you're the local side of the equation. Oh, th thank you for that. Yes, uh, I, I hope I can bring that experience uh, to the table and help all of, all of the stakeholders. And, and as you mentioned, so um, we have a lot of small businesses uh, volunteering their time to kind of help the Alliance, give their expertise, uh, of what it's like to be a defense contractor or people in say from the university or the private education sector of how they can help educate um, the workforce for today and tomorrow to meet the needs of not just the DOD, the public employer, but also many of the small businesses and as well as large defense contractors who need that talent pipeline to be able to service our military and their needs. You say workforce and I wanna trip on that for a minute. You know, you say workforce in this context, and I see two arrows, each one pointing to the other direction. In other words, the, the military provides employees for the, um, you know, the local business community. I know this, and I can tell you from the practice of law, they were always very attractive to us, uh, the spouses and also the retirees. Um, but the other, the other aspect is the local uh, business community provides uh, employees to the military. So how does that work and which one prevails? Uh, they're both integral and both very important. Um, on the public sector, uh, the Department of Defense employs, um, I don't know, maybe just under 20,000 people, civilians. Uh, I wanna uh, clarify that civilian uh, workers here in Hawaii. On the contracting side, I should know this number, it's, I don't know, 12 to 15,000 employees in companies who get contracts. And that number will fluctuate depending on uh, the type of contract and how many people are, are contracting at any given time. So, I mean, you're talking 35, 40,000 people. I mean, it's, and they are good paying jobs. And that's, I think, um, the key for us is um, these are, a uh, wide range of good paying jobs, both in um, uh, the say blue collar to white collar to um, PhD level. So it, it has the wide gamut to be able to provide, you know, local residents and local businesses uh, an opportunity for uh, good paying jobs. Does the Alliance, uh, uh, you know, facilitate the, you know, the job, the job applications, job market, getting jobs for people? So right now the Alliance is focused on uh, kind of doing an assessment of where are some of the gaps that uh, we can focus on to uh, fill, whether it be the needs for DOD, the public employer, or um, small business, um, I'm just gonna say businesses in general who contract with the military in Hawaii. And I think it's, we're doing that assessment now, like Jason mentioned, the Alliance was a creation of a SWOT analysis that DBED conducted a couple of years ago, and, and a lot of that is focused obviously in data sciences, cybersecurity, as well as in the shipbuilding area. Mm. Jason, I have a million questions. My first question too is, who is in fact in the Alliance? That's a, that's a great question, Jay. You know, it's, a, it's actually like a very representative of what is actually in the MAC, right? When you look at the membership of the MAC, it's primarily retired general officers, flag officers, 
uh, folks from industry, from the local community, uh, nonprofit organizations, academic institutions, such as University of Hawaii, et cetera, Native Hawaiian Organization Association. Um, and that's what you have within the alliance. And Pono will talk probably in more detail about the different working groups that we have that break out very specific areas like the small business ecosystem to small business support to workforce development. Uh, but what we've basically done is we've just more formalized this process in terms of when we look at this challenge of how do we expand more opportunities for the local businesses and people here in Hawaii, how do we get about doing it? So let's develop these working groups, let's figure out what the gaps are that exist. Because as you know, there's some great programs out there like the Small Business Administration, uh, PTAC, et cetera, that help out a lot of companies that are starting out. But there are some gaps. And so what are those gaps? And then we also know that doing business with the federal government is not an easy thing to do. There's a lot of barriers to entry. So how do we identify those barriers? You know, How do we help companies navigate those barriers? Because not only does it help Hawaii, again, as you've seen uh, very significantly, it helps the, the military in terms of the readiness. When they have a ready force here in terms of personnel and services that they can rely on, it really increases your readiness and your ability to execute your, your mission, whether it's peacetime or war. Um, so that's kind of how, what the makeup of the, of, of the alliance is. Mm, okay. You know, I, I, uh, you, everything you say makes me think of another question I want to ask you. Uh, so, so, you know, I talk about readiness. Uh, well, you know, Hawaii, um, you know, as here we are remote in the Pacific, um, subject to the possibility of storms, maybe extreme weather, given climate change on that, and uh, the, the possibility that we're going to need help as an isolated island state. Um, does the nexus uh, that the alliance provides, does that help in terms of, um, you know, having the military assist the civilian community in the event of some sort of uh, disaster? Yeah, Jay, I, I think it does most definitely. And there's actually a very close relationship when you look at Indo-PACOM, um, U.S. Indo-PACOM with the state, uh, as well as with the National Guard and Major General Kenny Harai. In fact, in my last duty station when I was a senior intel officer at U.S. Army Pacific, we actually would set up a joint uh, operations center with uh, Kenny and his folks, whenever there was a potential uh, disaster situation that would that would potentially impact the Hawaiian Islands, so whether that was from a electrical standpoint or flooding, and we had to get people off uh, from different areas within the Big Island uh, to uh, just humanitarian assistance in general. So that nexus is, is exists. It goes back to even when I was a lieutenant back here in Hurricane Iniki, and we deployed folks from the 25th Infantry to Kauai specifically to redo the power lines, to get food and water to folks and to kind of help with uh, build, uh, getting, you know, kind of the, 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 the general services back on island before the, the state and local counties could, could do that. So there's a very, very close relationship in Nexus. No, so it's, uh, it's comforting to know that, you know, people worry that, uh, you know, the, the, the larger mission of the military is national defense, of course, and they may or may not have time to, you know, assist with humanitarian assistance um you know to to their their venue here in hawaii but uh, i believe from everything i know that if that ever happened if we did have a, some sort of natural disaster what have you um the military would be in a position and motivated um to help us and 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 it's just it's human nature and it's um what do you want to call it it's people it's caring and and i believe that the military commanders here uh, would go out of their way take special pains to make sure that they use their resources to help the uh, civilian population. Do you feel the same way? Oh, Jay, 110%. Uh, it definitely is. I mean, it's, it's, if it's not an explicit part of the mission statement, it's definitely an implied task. You know, quite honestly, here within Indo-PACOM, one of the main talking points when you're talking about the military is that, you know, Indo-PACOM is a very unique uh, region of the world uh, the most consequential, right? When you look out the next 5, 10, 15, 20, even 30 or 40 years in terms of the amount of people, commerce. Uh, and also the thing to highlight is the amount of potential uh, threats or competitors that we have in this area, right? Four out of the five main ones exist in this area, North Korea, China, Russia, violent extremist organizations. And they also include very significant humanitarian assistance, disaster relief. So about 40 to 45% annually 
that occur in the world occur within this region alone, but the majority of impact to human life uh, and our way of life, not just us, but our partners and allies in the region, it's an 80% uh, significant impact to them. And, and, and a lot of it is when you start to look at human geography within a region, you know, it's very close uh, to the littoral areas, very close to, so from tsunamis and hurricanes and stuff, very susceptible to, to, to those issues and flooding. Uh, and so the military basically has uh, operation plans specifically designed for all those the, uh, situations, whether it's to help partner allies as well as here in Hawaii. And the thing I would highlight about here in Hawaii, as you know, Jay, of serving time in the military too, is, you know, the military is all about, you know, the extended family and being part of the community that they reside. Uh, and they do a very, I think, a very good job of really trying to be a good community member in terms of how they do outreach uh, and integrate it because their, their families live day to day. They, they work off post, their kids play baseball and baseball teams, they go shopping, you know, they do all those things. They're part of the community. And so, you know, if that community is threatened, the military is going to come to the aid. We want that. We want that. Uh, on both sides of the equation, we want to have that relationship. In fact, I would go a step further and say we want it to be especially close, especially tight, especially warm and loving here than anywhere else in the country. And I think we actually have that. That's my observation of it. Uh, so let's talk about some of the projects, Pono. Um, you know, uh, Jason talked about outreach. I guess you're the outreach man. Uh, can you talk about some of the projects you're consulting with to where the Alliance reaches out into the civilian community? So right now we have four uh, working groups who are um, kind of tasked with certain areas. So one who is the obvious is workforce development. And there lies a group of um, small businesses, some large businesses, as well as various people from the education community, as well as um, like say Keala Chak from the chamber who runs the sector partnership program. And their job, kind of like what I talked about earlier is, right, taking a look at the needs for DOD as a public employer, as well as this um, business community needs for talent pipeline. Then we have the small business support working group and their job is to um, come up with programs, well, one, again, assess what the needs are and then come up with programs to say, you know, how can we help small businesses get certified? As Jason talked about, being a federal contractor and then being a defense contractor has a lot of um, uh, barriers and loophole, I mean, not loopholes, but um, uh, qualifications and requirements that you have to meet that are fairly rigorous. Um, the newest and latest is obviously making sure you are um, certified and have certain levels of cybersecurity in your organization, even if you not, are not an IT company. You still have to have certain um, certifications to be just a contractor with the military. So and all that of those include so, clearances, what, no? Um, I mean, depending on your work, and, and Jason can speak much better to that, but I mean, even if you are a, say, a, a painting company, you still need to have a certain level of cybersecurity certification um, because it um, because it's so important. So uh, that group is making sure companies have what they need in just not just EOD procurement uh, certifications and meeting the guidelines, but also um, cybersecurity. Then we have, um, so right, making sure you are able to do business with the military. Next is then the ecosystem, right? How do we help uh, companies get together to be able to uh, successfully contract with the military? And that often includes not just helping the small businesses, but helping the large companies, you know, doing some matchmaking, doing industry J's, making sure there is that um, a relationship with uh, the contracting agency so people know who um, they are and feel comfortable to reach out to them. And then the last uh, group is um, taking a look at how can we make the defense sector resilient? And that means are businesses able to weather the ups and downs of um, the spending of the Department of Defense in Hawaii, because it's not all up, right? So if there's dips, are, are, are you uh, well diversified? 
you know, do you do other public work, city, state work? How about private sector work? And taking a look at some of those other opportunities. So in each of those areas, we're taking a look at programs, whether it be, like I mentioned, industry days, matchmaking, thinking of doing resume banks, um, especially in the tech sector, right? Keeping up a host of uh, resumes on hand. So as, as um, both public and private sector need to have access to people still looking for work. So those are some of the things that we are looking at and working with the various stakeholders. Yeah, and we need, we need to have the, uh, a strong tech element in this because ultimately, and I hope it's soon and not later, uh, we'll have um, a residual workforce from the process that you're describing where people have had experience in and out of the military that will help them organize tech companies because that we need to diversify, that's my view. Um, but I wanted to ask you, you, you mentioned ups and downs and changes and whatnot. And, you know, there's nothing so constant has changed. Um, and certainly we've had some changes in the past, what, uh, 18 months. And I would like you to discuss, um, you know, how COVID affected all of this one way or the other. Um, you know, the flow to the military, the flow from the military, the relationships, the amount of business that the local business, uh, you know, uh, community was getting or not. Um, how it was affected, um, because we know that COVID has changed our world in many ways permanently. Uh, can you talk about that? Sure, I'll, I'll start off and Jason probably can add a lot more. I mean, at least for this project, I mean, right, like everybody else, you're doing things virtually. Um, but the one thing we've learned in the few months we've been together is clearly, um, and no surprise, that uh, the military has been a great um, economic partner and benefit for Hawaii. It has been stable, both on the public employment side, as well as the uh, private contracting side. And it is, um, I, what is it, 15, 18% of state GDP. It's second only to tourism and it's a stable part and also provides, like I mentioned earlier, um, a lot of good paying jobs. And I think that's an important part of that. And um, Jason, yeah. Things you no, that's a, that's a great overview, Pono. I mean, you know, some of the data points, Jay, that's one area that we've seen that federal spending, especially during times of economic downturn, specifically Department of Defense, has been very stable. So even if you go back to 2008, 2009, and kind of the economic crisis that we had here in Hawaii, and then recently here with COVID, uh, thank goodness that we had the DOD as the number two economic driver, right? Because that spending stayed, and actually last year, you know, it went up. So the year prior, it was $2.5 billion in just contracting dollars that were spent out by the Department of Defense. Last year, it was $2.7 billion. Uh, and a, a little more than half of that went to companies, local companies here in Hawaii. So as we look at that, that's pretty tremendous. And that doesn't take into account some of the other contracting jobs. The military <clears throat> refers to SRM, which is sustainment, restoration, and modernization. So think of everything it takes to upkeep you know, small city. So from HVAC repair to plumbers to yard folks, et cetera, that all the 11 bases here in Hawaii, I mean, they're basically mini cities. Uh, and that SRM budget is pretty significant and provides a lot of opportunity and jobs for a lot of small companies here in Hawaii. So that's what if I would say anything, what the last 18 months has done, it has really shined a light on um, the importance of creating this Hawaii Defense Alliance, of why exactly what you're saying, Jay, why we need to embrace it, we need to look at, and we need to further take advantage of it and have more opportunity for the local businesses as well as our, our, our folks. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we look at it, I give you that statistic of about half of that 2.7 billion has gone to local companies. Well, the, the, the owner's job we passed Pono is, okay, we'll make that all 2.7 billion, right? You go figure it out with the working groups um, of those, you know, what he didn't talk about too was the payroll. So payroll for the military, and this includes civilians, is about $5 billion a year here in Hawaii. Uh, and like Pono said, 20,000 uh, of those are civilian jobs, you know, GS jobs uh, or WG jobs working down at the, at the shipyard. Uh, so within that $5 billion, there's a portion, probably about one, $1.5 billion that is just for civilian employees and so our, our other goal is, okay, how do we maximize that too? So instead of the organizations here having to go recruit from, you know, um, from DC or Texas or from California, 
is there a way for us to kind of create that uh, education pipeline, workforce development? So we're growing some of those key jobs here in Hawaii, right? Workforce development and getting more folks locally here uh, employed in those positions. So I think if anything, last 18 months have really shined a light on what a tremendous opportunity this is. And the timing of the Hawaii Defense Alliance just happened to be, you know, right at this time, it's like perfect timing because everyone is, is you don't really have to uh, do a hard uh, uh, sales pitch to it about the, the, you know, the benefits of this. I think everyone kind of gets it when you start talking about it. Yeah, but there's more. This is like one of those ads on TV. There's more. Okay. And what, <laughs> what, and what is the more? Well, <clears throat> the more is, um, you know, we're having a kind of a de facto pivot because of the uh, trouble and the threat uh, of China and its uh, aspirations over Taiwan and the like, uh, some of the aggressive things it's done and has said it will do. Um, and you know, if I were the president, nobody's actually voting for me right now, but if I were the president, uh, I, would, I would put more resources in the Pacific right now in order to preserve American interests. It's very important we do that. And I mean, what does the Pacific mean in terms of the military? Well, our most important you know, focus is here in Hawaii. This is, this is where the action is. This is where the force is, so to speak, more than any other place in the Pacific, really. Um, this is where we have the talent, the equipment, and so forth. <clears throat> so I would guess, uh, and if I were the president, I would probably make this happen, uh, that there'd be more resources coming out here um, into the system that you described. Uh, in other words, um, you know, have a certain amount of, of need by the military for help from the civilian community. You have a, a certain amount of uh, you know, connection between the two. And if I'm right, <clears throat> and we have more uh, commands out here, more troops out here, more equipment, personnel, what have you, um, we're going to need we're going to need more from the civilian community, and the whole connection will be more robust, more demanding, if you will. And so, uh, um, I think the alliance will be faced with that change going forward. Uh, do you agree? Uh, how do you see it changing with changing times? But yeah, I, I'll vote for you. You know, <laughs> you get your ticket, and I'll vote for you with that platform. I, I agree a hundred percent, Jay. It's great, right? Everything you say, I agree with. I mean, I do, but I agree 110 um, percent. You know, the strategic importance of Hawaii has has only gone up in a number of years. You know, back 100, 150 years when they said, you know, Hawaii was so strategically important to the Pacific. It's even more so now for the reasons that we have discussed. Um, and you're right. What what you see that manifest in is the physical presence of the military organizations that reside here in Hawaii. Hawaii is the only state that has a geographic combatant command and every component, right? We've got the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, the Marines. We have a special operations command here as well. And we have a thing called, uh, uh, this thing called NSA Hawaii. We also have NETCAMS, which is out there, which is the largest communications facility in the world uh, that's here. And we have this thing called Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard, right? One of four public shipyards, actually the top rated of four public shipyards. Um, and so you see some of that resourcing. It's the number one shipyard. It looks like it's going to get the majority of funding that is being allocated to the upgrade of the shipyards and to the Good. fleet in, in general. Good. You see a, a lot of the organizations that are here that are actually at the leading front of the experimental uh, designs that they're doing, whether it's for the Army and multi-domain operations. U.S. Army Pacific is the pilot for the Army. Uh, Pacific Air Force is the pilot for the Air Force in terms of looking at this concept of agile basing. Um, the Marines uh, at Mar uh, Connie Marine Corps Base uh, for a littoral regiment, which is kind of the redesigning how Marines fight. And so you're seeing that. The, the second point I'd like to bring out, and you mentioned this earlier on, which is a really key point, is all this technology and all, all the things that are going on when we look at our main competitors, you know, China and Russia, it's this evolution of technology, which is going so quickly, which, you know, the argument is, is that uh, folks like the peer, uh, China, as well as Russia are now pacing peers that in some areas, they're on a equal footing with us in terms of technological advances. Uh, and that's driving this huge demand for these tech type of jobs, whether it's in IT, cyber, data science, data analytics, and intelligence. And that's something that we identified as we looked at Hawaii Defense Alliance, that is the second emerging industry that is, is rising to prominence here 
that we really need to take advantage because as you know, Jay, right, it, it, it goes to uh, the uh, opportunity uh, for the local uh, the kids here who are looking, who want to get into the tech sector and be very relevant. And so instead of us having to recruit from the mainland, we want the mainland to be trying to recruit from Hawaii because we've got all these folks who are really skilled in the tech field. Um, so it's, it's bringing um, this new industry to, to light um, and the opportunities there are really, really significant. That's great. We're almost out of time. Uh, Pono, could I ask you to tell me what you see in the future um, for the Alliance and for your consulting? Uh, for the Alliance, I think uh, a lot of good energy ideas and programs to be able to help uh, our residents be able to fill a lot of those jobs that the Department of Defense has and has needs for and then helping more companies get more contracts and continue to serve uh, the needs of our military in Hawaii. For me, hopefully uh, uh, continuing to work on projects that um, help our state uh, move forward. Great, all good. This is really interesting to learn about. So Jason, we are out of time now, but I wanna give you the opportunity to leave a message. What message you know, would you leave with the people who are watching this? What would you want uh, you know, them to think about going forward? Thanks, Jay. What I would say is I think we've got just a tremendous opportunity here to take advantage of um, the military presence here in Hawaii, the strategic importance of it, the jobs, the opportunity, and really look at, you know, how do we get the key stakeholders together to really provide more opportunities, not only to our businesses, but to our young uh, folks who are in school and aspiring uh, to go to college uh, or to get a job in a great trade uh, and support. Um, you know, both the state of Hawaii as well as the military. How can they learn more? How can they learn more about the Alliance? Where do they go? Who do they talk to? So right now, Jay, I think, uh, and Pono, please add to this. Uh, our link is uh, Hawaii Defense Alliance, which is uh, within the Chamber of Commerce right now as a, as a link. Uh, Pono, I don't know, if, have we actually stood up our separate website yet? It's just a landing page right now until we put up more content. Which we will shortly. Okay, and what will the address be? Um, I think what Jason sa said is Hawaii um, Defense Alliance okay. org. Well, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Bono. Great to talk to you guys. It's really, uh, it's actually very encouraging to hear this, and uh, and I wish you all, all all the best and all the members of the alliance. Uh, you're part of the backbone of Hawaii. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jay. Look forward to you on the ticket. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Aloha. Bye-bye.